Welcome to A Plus Health Life channel. We discuss the ways to fulfill your life with more quality and inform you on ways to get to your life goals with less effort. Please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. The 5 Stages of Intermittent Fasting Intermittent fasting isn't just a weight loss strategy or a hack that bodybuilders use to lose fat quickly while maintaining lean muscle mass. It is at its best a healthy lifestyle informed by human evolution and the study of metabolism. It asks the human body to be much more efficient and self-protective than it is accustomed to being in modern times. There are many things that happen when we fast that either don't happen when we are always in a fed state or that happen very slowly in the background of glucose metabolism. Scroll down to learn more about the five stages of intermittent fasting. In a well-fed state, the individual cell in your body is in growth mode. It's insulin signaling and MTOR pathways that tell the cell to grow, divide and synthesize proteins are active. By the way, these pathways, when overactive, have implications in cancer growth. The mammalian target of rapamycin, or MTOR, loves having plentiful nutrients around, especially carbohydrates and proteins. When active, MTOR tells the cell not to bother with autophagy, literally cellular, self-eating, a recycling and cleanup process that rids your body of damaged and misfolded proteins for example. The well-fed cell isn't worried about being efficient and recycling its components, it's too busy growing and dividing. In a well-fed state, your cells and their components are also highly acetylated. This means that various molecules in your cells, including the packaging proteins called histones that wrap your DNA up nicely within the core of your cells, are decorated with acetyl groups on their lysine amino acid residues. Don't worry if you don't understand the jargon in that last sentence. What you really need to know is that the well-fed cell has many genes, including those associated with cellular survival and proliferation, turned on. This is because acetylation tends to loosen the packaging proteins that normally keep your DNA wrapped up, and lets your DNA be read for protein production. While your cells turn on cellular growth and proliferation genes when you aren't fasting, they also turn other genes off. These include genes related to fat metabolism, stress resistance and damage repair. Actually, when you fast some of your fat gets turned into ketone bodies that appear to reactivate these genes, leading to lowered inflammation and stress resistance in the brain for example. But during starvation, things are very different. When you are fasting, your body reacts to what it sees as an environmental stress low food availability by changing the expression of genes that are important in protecting you from, well, stress. We have a well-preserved starvation program that kicks our cell into a completely different state when food, particularly glucose or sugar, isn't around. When you fast, and when you exercise, you activate the AMPK signaling pathway. AMPK or 5 feet amp activated protein kinase is the brake to mature's gas pedal. AMPK signals the cell to go into self-protective mode, activating autophagy and fat breakdown. It inhibits MTOR. At the same time, while you are fasting the levels of a molecule called NAD+, begin to rise because you don't have the dietary proteins and sugars around that normally convert NAD+, to NADH through the Krebs cycle. NAD+, a molecule whose precursor is vitamin B3, activates the sirtuins, SIRT1 and SIRT3. Have you heard of the longevity molecule in wine called resveratrol? Yep, it became famous as being a potential activator of the sirtuins. These sirtuins are proteins that remove the acetyl groups we talked about above from histones and other proteins. In this process, the sirtuins silence genes related to cell proliferation and activate proteins involved in creating new mitochondria the power generating factories of your cells and cleaning up reactive oxygen species. Ketones, also produced during fasting, work as deacetylase inhibitors, in other words, keeping acetyl groups in place. This turns on genes related to antioxidant processes and damage repair. Phew, that's a lot happening while your body isn't taking in any calories. But when exactly do these things happen? We've helped you visualize the timeline below and in the Life Fasting Tracker app, with a series of icons on the Life Fasting arc that represent the five stages of fasting. 
Some of this fat is used by the liver to produce ketone bodies. Ketone bodies, or ketones, serve as an alternative energy source for the cells of your heart, skeletal muscle, and brain, when glucose isn't readily available. Did you know that your brain uses up some 60% of your glucose when your body is in the resting state? When you are fasting, ketone bodies generated by your liver partly replace glucose as fuel for your brain as well as other organs. This ketone usage by your brain is one of the reasons that fasting is often claimed to promote mental clarity and positive mood. Ketones produce less inflammatory products as they are being metabolized than does glucose, and they can even kick-start production of the brain growth factor BDNF. Ketones have also been shown to reduce cellular damage and cell death in neurons and can also reduce inflammation in other cell types. By 18 hours, you've switched to fat-burning mode and are generating significant ketones Anton et al., Obesity 2018. You can now begin to measure blood ketone levels above your baseline values. Under normal conditions, the concentration of ketones in your plasma ranges between 0.05 and 0.1 m. When you fast or restrict the carbohydrates in your diet, this concentration can reach 5 to 7 m. As their level in your bloodstream rises, ketones can act as signaling molecules, similar to hormones, to tell your body to ramp up stress-busting pathways that reduce inflammation and repair damaged DNA for example. Within 24 hours, your cells are increasingly recycling old components and breaking down misfolded proteins linked to Alzheimer's and other diseases Alirezai et al., Autophagy 2010. This is a process called autophagy. Autophagy is an important process for cellular and tissue rejuvenation, it removes damaged cellular components including misfolded proteins. When your cells can't or don't initiate autophagy, bad things happen, including neurodegenerative diseases, which seem to come about as a result of the reduced autophagy that occurs during aging. Fasting activates the AMPK signaling pathway and inhibits MTOR activity, which in turn activates autophagy. This only begins to happen, however, when you substantially deplete your glucose stores and your insulin levels begin to drop. In mice deprived of food, autophagy increases after 24 hours and this effect is magnified in cells of the liver and brain after 48 hours. In humans, autophagy has been detected in neutrophils starting at 24 hours of fasting. Exercise together with caloric restriction through fasting can also increase autophagy in many body tissues. Peak growth hormone by 48 hours without calories or with very few calories, carbs or protein, your growth hormone level is up to 5 times as high as when you started your fast. Part of the reason for this is that ketone bodies produced during fasting promote growth hormone secretion, for example in the brain. Ghrelin, the hunger hormone, also promotes growth hormone secretion. Growth hormone helps preserve lean muscle mass and reduces fat tissue accumulation, particularly as we age. It also appears to play a role in mammalian longevity and can promote wound healing and cardiovascular health. Minimum insulin by 54 hours, your insulin has dropped to its lowest level point since you started fasting and your body is becoming increasingly insulin sensitive Klein et al. 1993. Lowering your insulin levels has a range of health benefits both short term and long term. Lowered insulin levels put a break on the insulin and MTOR signaling pathways, activating autophagy. Lowered insulin levels can reduce inflammation, make you more insulin sensitive and or less insulin resistant, which is especially a good thing if you have a high risk of developing diabetes and protect you from chronic diseases of aging including cancer. By 72 hours, your body is breaking down old immune cells and generating new ones. Prolonged fasting reduces circulating IGF-1 levels and PKA activity in various cell populations. IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1, looks a lot like insulin and has growth-promoting effects on almost every cell in the body. IGF-1 activates signaling pathways including the PI3K ACT pathway that promotes cell survival and growth. PKA can also activate the MTOR pathway and, of interest, too much caffeine during a fast may promote activation of PKA.
you might see where this is leading. Pressing the brakes on IGF-1 and PKA through nutrient restriction and fasting can turn down cellular survival pathways and lead to breakdown and recycling of old cells and proteins. Studies in mice have shown that prolonged fasting greater than 48 hours by reducing IGF-1 and PKA leads to stress resistance, self-renewal and regeneration of hematopoietic or blood cell stem cells. Through this same mechanism, prolonged fasting for 72 hours has been shown to preserve healthy white blood cell or lymphocyte counts in patients undergoing chemotherapy. As interest grows in intermittent fasting, so do the questions about how to get the most out of the weight loss strategy. The benefits are clear, the plans can be easy to follow, some don't require any calorie counting, they can make people healthier and may even delay the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Intermittent fasting also doesn't lead to eating disorders or slow down a person's metabolism. Typically for a few weeks after the holidays to lose a few pounds. The 16 to 8 plan is less intense than the other plans, but if she wants a more rapid weight loss, she'll opt for alternate day fasting. The first five fast days are pretty tricky, but once your body gets adjusted to that kind of up-down pattern of eating, it actually gets really easy. So how do you boost your chances of intermittent fasting success? First things, first, always check with your doctor before starting a diet. Intermittent fasting is not for everyone, including people with type 1 diabetes, pregnant women and lactating women. People with binge eating disorder will tend to overeat during their eating window, so this type of regimen won't work for them, she added. Consider the intermittent fasting plan right for you, some of the popular regimens include. The 16 to 8 diet, or time-restricted feeding, where you fast for 16 hours a day, but are free to eat whatever you want in the other 8 hours. Experts advise picking an eating window that lets you finish your meals fairly early, such as 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. or earlier, because your body is less efficient at putting sugar away as the day goes by. Alternate day fasting, which means limiting yourself to 500 calories one day, then eating whatever you want the next, and then repeating that process. The 5-2-2 plan, which means incorporating two non-consecutive fast days into your week, then eating normally during the other days. Here are tips to keep your plan on track. How can I suppress hunger during intermittent fasting? Eat high-fiber foods, such as nuts, beans, fruits and vegetables, and high-protein foods, including meat, fish, tofu, or nuts, during your eating window. Drink lots of water. People tend to think they're hungry, when they are really just thirsty. After man, 38, dies of heart attack, wife shares urgent message, go to the ur, go for black coffee or tea, or cinnamon or licorice herbal teas. These beverages may have appetite suppressing effects. Watch less TV, I know this sounds strange, but while you are watching TV, you are bombarded with dozens of ads for food. This can make you feel hungry, when in actuality, you are not hungry at all. When should I exercise? That combined alternate day fasting and exercise, they allowed the participants to pick whether they wanted to exercise on a feasting or fasting day, and found there was no strong preference one way or the other. But the researchers were surprised the dieters actually reported feeling more energetic on fasting days. What is the OMAD diet? Learn how the one meal a day diet works that being said, exercise before you eat because people get hungry about half an hour after they finish working out and may find it too hard to stick to their plan if they can't eat anything at all afterwards. If you're on the 16 to 8 plan, exercise before or during your eating window. If you're doing alternate day fasting and are exercising on your 500 calorie day, save food for after your exercise session. Is it okay to skip breakfast? Yes. The notion that omitting a morning meal is bad for your waistline likely began with studies sponsored by cereal companies, and most of that research looked at the effects of breakfast skipping on cognition in children, I'm not sure how that all got translated to body weight. Indeed, a 2015 study found breakfast may not be the most important meal for weight loss. Another analysis, by obesity and nutrition researcher David Allison, found there wasn't scientific data to definitively support a link between eating breakfast and weight loss, or skipping breakfast and weight gain. How do I combat feelings of low energy or low focus during fasting? 
try drinking black coffee, it helps improve concentration and energy, and has no calories in it. Take a deep breath and give yourself a break, mindfulness and a bit of meditation can go a long way in helping to make you feel better during the fasting period. Please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel.